everyone, and thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Ryan Peters, and I am giving this presentation today called Your Program is a Language. It is a very fun little talk that I've spent quite a bit of time preparing about DSLs, particularly the embedded variety in Scala, and how they can improve your code quality and program architecture. Before we get started, I want to give a couple quick things. First, I want to talk about me. If anyone doesn't know who I am, uh, I'm not particularly important, so that's okay. But I am a senior Scala engineer at 47 degrees, and I've been writing Scala professionally since about 2018. I'm also not really that much of an academic, so uh, if anyone is going to ask any questions, uh, please refrain from asking anything about category theory because I actually know about as much as you do if you're asking questions. <laughs> And the second thing I want to go over is something about the nature of this presentation. So the, uh, the code that is in this presentation is all in Scala 3. If there's any code that I'm demoing specifically, I'm going to make sure to have a Scala 2 version available online by the time this talk premieres. It is also being pre-recorded. So you were watching a version of me that was recorded on the morning of November 1st. This is kind of an intermediate-ish level talk. So if there's something that comes up that you don't understand and I don't explain it, then feel free to ask a question, but I probably won't say it in the talk because we're a bit strapped on time and I'm trying to squeeze as much in here as possible. So let's get started. Let's talk about what we talk about when we talk about DSLs. So DSLs, what does that stand for? Domain specific language, right? Domain specific meaning uh, it relates to a particular field or a problem. So, for example, uh, document uh, rendering or markdown or something like that. The second part is language, which is a set of rules and expressions for communication. The reason that we have DSLs in the first place is because we are trying to communicate the nature of a configuration or a problem that relates to a particular domain. I made this chart about uh, a few hours uh, before I considered myself finished with these slides. So it doesn't come from anywhere. And I apologize to anyone who finds something horribly wrong with it. But this is my understanding of how languages uh, sort themselves into high and low levels. So at the very bottom, you have the hardware. Uh, your CPU has its own set of instructions. And on top of that, you have assembly. On top of that, you have languages that are compiled or interpreted. I don't really make a distinction here because they're kind of the same thing if you think about it. And on top of that, we have library code, which abstracts away from the low level bits of those languages so that you can represent more abstract concepts. A more sp particularly advanced kind of library code is your average high level DSL. So the average DSL is meant to communicate requirements a lot more so than how you actually go about those requirements. For example, let's say you have a requirement to be able to do things with uh, financial accounts or reads something like increase balance of account X by 500 cents. We're talking less about how you're going about solving the problem and we're more describing what we want to do first. And a good DSL allows you to abstract over the difference between what you want to do and how. Raise your hand if you've ever heard this one before. You want high cohesion and low coupling. What on earth does that mean, right? Well, so low coupling basically means that you want code that doesn't really depend on each other too much to exist. You can have code that stands on its own and represents what it's trying to do without going overboard and requiring you bring the entire world along with it to get it to work. And high cohesion means that related things are kept very closely together in the same module. So for example, if you have some code that uh, relates to a particular language, you don't want that language to necessarily depend on other languages too much. It can build on top of them, but you, you don't want a lot of back and forth. You don't want to have to spin up an entire system to understand how your code works. I mentioned earlier that uh, interpreters and compilers are kind of the same thing. So throughout this talk, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the need for 
domain specific languages to be interpreted or compiled sometimes, but not all the time. And when I say compiler, think interpreter. When I say interpreter, think compiler. And they, because they, they mean the exact same thing. Uh, try not to get too confused if you see them in different places and you thought, oh, well, I thought this was supposed to be an interpreter. Well, they're the exact same thing. And the reason that they are sometimes interpreted or compiled is that we get a layer of indirection, right? When you're writing a language, you want to have that language separated from how that language is implemented. And you want to be able to write generic abstract code that only captures the particulars of the domain you are trying to model. And in my opinion, this is what makes the DSL good, is that it has that layer of indirection. It has that layer of separation of concerns. So here's a quick little pop quiz. I did not mention this, but I want to I want to see what people think. What is the difference between normal library code and ADSL? Okay, stop the clock. So uh, I lied a bit. Uh, this is a bit of a misleading question because, in my opinion, there really isn't a difference between library code and a DSL. And this is one of the things that I'm going to try and hammer on in this in this talk a bit, is that I, I mentioned earlier that good DSLs are ones that allow enough abstraction between your language and your implementation. But that doesn't mean that every DSL has to fit that mold, right? You can write code that is not that abstract but still counts as a DSL. A good DSL is something that is used to model your business requirements as directly as possible. And you can have high-level and low-level DSLs. So you can have a, a DSL that operates very close to the business requirement level. And then you can have a DSL below that that actually implements that, but it doesn't totally implement it. Maybe that DSL is also built on top of another DSL, and that DSL is built on top of another DSL, and so on and so forth. Here's a quick example from HTTP4S, which shows the routing DSL. What's happening here is this is how you describe matching on a path. In this case, we are matching a GET request at the path slash user slash user ID, where the user ID is any integer. And this will be passed to whatever function you have that generates your request. What makes this a DSL is, well, that it's code. Because like I just said, there's no real difference between code and a DSL. But what makes this a particularly interesting one is that it allows you to use custom syntax to more accurately and more succinctly represent the concept of matching on a path. Here's a much more complicated example that I think is very interesting. Uh, this is directly pulled from the Akka Streams documentation. If you've ever used Akka Streams, they have this uh, DSL for building graphs. And as a streaming library, sometimes what you want to do is you want to direct a flow of data in your system. And this is the way that they have this configured. So you have sources and sinks, which is where data comes in and out. You can broadcast your data across multiple different lanes and then merge them back in together. And the way you express that is with this custom DSL. This DSL is interesting because they mention in the documentation that it was designed with the intention to be able to uh, copy directly from like a whiteboard. Like you could, you could bring in a bunch of your coworkers onto a whiteboard and just draw out how the data is supposed to flow around and then translate it directly into this DSL. And of course, who could forget Scala tags is a pretty obvious example. If you're generating HTML in Scala and you're not using this or something just like it, then I don't know what you're doing because this pretty much directly, um, allows you to translate Scala into HTML. If you know HTML and you can look at this and understand what it means, then you can tell that the DSL is doing a very good job. Another thing that I want to touch on a bit that I will touch on a lot more later is that because I'm making the argument that basically all code is a DSL, type classes are also DSLs in a way. Monads. Everyone loves monads. Uh, everyone knows what they are, right? I don't have to explain them in this talk, I hope. <laughs> but um, anything that has a flat map is probably a monad. And 
the reason that uh, we call them monads is, of course, because it's it's useful to be able to categorize things based on what they are capable of doing. And in this case, monads are basically um, constructs that we can use to, to model dependent computations. I mentioned that it's useful to talk about what something can do. So both DSLs in general, especially the abstract ones and type classes, encode this idea of capability. What operations are legal? What concepts can I represent? There's a reason that people do this, and that's because it's a pretty good way to model that notion of capability as a DSL. So now I've given you the rundown on what the deal is with DSLs, and now we're going to talk a little bit about styles and implementation. So the, there are two main categories of DSLs. There's embedded and external or parsed DSLs. Embedded DSLs are the ones that we're mostly going to be focusing on today. Uh, those are using a host language, in our case, Scala. And you are building the DSL as code in that language. And as such, because you are reusing the Scala compiler, you are reusing the standard library, you're reusing all of these things, it is very little work to actually implement it. And you can get very, very good results very quickly. However, uh, external and parse DSLs, they are a lot more flexible with syntax. Uh, one thing that you cannot do with an embedded DSL is you cannot override Scala keywords, for example, or you cannot so easily express concepts that the type system does not really uh, recognize. There's a reason that we write external DSLs, of course, and that's because they are very portable. They're very uh, separated from any kind of language because they are themselves a language. So embedded DSLs, let's talk about those. Uh, so there's syntax that just goes over regular Scala that doesn't really try to abstract that much. You have macros and code generation, which is really useful when you want to uh, go beyond what regular Scala is able to give you. You have uh, data structures or free representations. And then there's tagless final style, which is written in terms of an abstract effect and is a lot more flexible than uh, any of the others except for macros, of course. To get into the syntax bit, I want to very quickly touch on some cool features that Scala 3 has to allow you to write some nice syntax. And those are opaque types and extension uh, methods here. Let's say that you're writing a DSL to uh, deal with uh, high scores. Maybe you're, maybe you're publishing a video game and uh, you have a database or whatever that deals with uh, you know, what player has the highest score. And at some point you wanna know what the highest score is. So you can create a very basic DSL to, to model this concept very easily. First, we wanna have natural numbers, which are any numbers, uh, any integers that are non-negative. And then we also want to have a high score, which is a separate type from natural, but we're going to have it be the same thing underneath. So both of these are integers. You can create a high score from a natural, but you cannot create it from an integer because an integer could be negative. To be able to increment your high score and to be able to compare high scores, we have some extension methods down at the bottom. And this is the syntax that you would use to do that. So what this opaque type does, for anyone who is not super familiar with Scala 3, is it kind of acts like a wrapper class. You would have um, a type, and you want to add certain behaviors related to your business to that type, or you want to have certain uh, private functionality to it. And you would create a class that wraps it and has those behaviors. However, that has a runtime cost. So opaque types are basically just a way to tell the compiler, hey, can you pretend everywhere except where this is defined that it is a new type? And I'll thank you later. And that's, and that's what it does. So here, uh, to the user, high score and natural might as well be wrapper classes around int. They might as well be, but they're not. They are integers, but the, your users won't know that. So you only give them this very limited DSL that works over integers. So now we are getting to the part where we are starting to separate our implementation a bit from the actual language. And the first way that we're going to do this is by making our DSL as a data structure. We've defined a little data structure here as an ADT using Scala 3 enum syntax, which if you haven't seen it before is 
You can think of it like syntax sugar on top of uh, creating a, a sealed trait that is extended by multiple case classes and case objects. In this case, what we are representing as our language is these four operations. Print, which prints to the console. Do next, which sequences one operation into another, but we don't care what the type of the first one is. Read input, which is intended to ask the user for some input. Transform, which will take a string input and then apply a transformation to it. And then we have only one case for the actual transformation right now, which is uh, two lower case. At the very bottom, let's skip this compiler part real quick. Here we have an actual program. We have a do next containing a print statement followed by a transformation of the input we ask from the user. In a, in a proper system, you probably wouldn't have users construct this data structure because the order of operations is, is a little weird. Normally, you want people to think of uh, how your program works as going line by line or sequencing with some kind of infix operator. But in this case, we're just showing how to create the data structure. And right above the program, we have our compiler, which is just a function from custom DSL to some a value. So if we are returning a string, then this will just give us a string back. It's wrapped in cats.id, which is the effect of not having an effect. Uh, just like how option as a type is an optional value, or list is a zero or more values of a certain type, id just means it's that value. It's one value, and there's nothing special about it at all. So it's, it's just a type alias, actually, in the actual cat's code base. But it's useful when you're working with uh, types that expect you to have some sort of higher kinded type. So in, in this case, we are actually using id on purpose. And that is because we are going to try and transform this into a uh, free DSL. So based on our previous code, uh, we're going to use this thing called free, which is also known as the free monad. And uh, you should you should have a general idea what a monad is. And I mentioned it earlier that monads are the essence of creating dependent computations, right? So if I have this data structure, I want to turn it into a monad. This is basically what I would do is you define a type that is al aliased to free, containing your data type as well as the result of your program. And then from here, you can just define some functions that turn that into an instance of free. What this does is it's constructing a data structure that sequences these things together. So in this case, we don't actually need to implement, if I go back, uh, we don't need to implement do next with free because monads allow us to represent that exact same thing with flat map, right? So we can create a program. So right down here, uh, this free program is print hello followed by print world. And this, this little operator here, if you haven't seen that, that in cats is usually called follow by. It also exists in Zio and other code bases as well because it's, it's really common. It's really common operator. Uh, that basically means um, do this first thing, flat map into the next one, but discard the result of the first one. And then in order to actually compile, we are going to reuse the compiler from the previous page. So remember I said that we're using id for a reason here, and that's because uh, this fold map function here. What we're doing is we're taking our program, and then we are passing in a function from one type that has a single type parameter to another type that has a single type parameter. And because we just want to return the raw value, we we're using this type alias id to say that we are returning just that value that doesn't have an effect. There are some limitations to this and there are some downsides. The first thing that should be pretty obvious if you're paying attention, I mentioned that this creates a data structure of your data structure that sequences these things, you're going to be allocating a lot at runtime. And while that's probably not that big of a deal, and again, I think I think in most programs, you're going to be limited by the network first before anything else. Um, if you're doing any CPU intensive work, there's there are ways to uh, reduce that, um, mainly by using other DSL techniques, which I will get to. But um, anyway, we should continue. 
Oh, I forgot to mention free applicative. Uh, free monad is when you want to create computations that are dependent on each other. So if I have an f of a and I want to take the result of f of a and feed that into creating an f of b, that's what flat map does, that's what monad does, and that's what the free monad gives you for your DSL. Free applicative is when you just want to represent independent computations. Tagless final is where we're going next, where uh, instead of creating a data structure, we are creating a trait that is parameterized over a type that also has its own type parameter. This is called a higher kind of type. And this is a way for us to abstract over the actual implementation just as much as with the data structure, only now we are using regular functions. The main difference here is that our compiler is not a function, but it is an instance of our DSL trait. So we can say that our programs are implemented in terms of their interpreters. So instead of creating a program and then passing it to an interpreter, we are writing the program with the interpreter, only we don't know what it is yet. Right here we can see uh, this uh, def program. We're saying that our, our program, which is implemented by this F type that we don't know what it is yet, it needs applicative, which is the ability to sequence ops, and it needs our custom DSL. And I've, I've given it a name so that I can just import these functions into scope and use them as I intend. So in this case, I'm going to do the same thing as before. We're going to print, read input, and transform to lowercase. The only difference here is that we're just writing uh, functions. We are not actually creating a data structure at all. This will run our code. And the actual compiled program is at the very bottom. It's this very short and succinct line. We take our program and then we give it the interpreter. It doesn't have to be implicit, by the way. You can pass these things in normally. So if I removed the using here and I just passed it in as this DSL object, you can do that too. In fact, that's actually the preferred way to do it for a lot of cases where there's probably going to be more than one of something in your code base or they are not separated by types. Another thing to mention before we move on to the next slide is that this is all often called an algebra for reasons I will not get into in this talk. This trade at the top is our custom DSL algebra. And what we've done is we've basically implemented this algebra as a kind of type class by making it implicit, by make, giving it an implicit instance, rather, and by being able to treat it the same way as any other type class. Uh, creating a data structure and using free, I think, is pretty easy to teach to people who just want to express a language. It's pretty intuitive. A lot of other programming languages, this is sort of the way that you would do this thing anyway, if you want to have multiple interpreters. The main problems with this approach, there are two main problems, are that it is a little bit more boilerplate. You have to write the data structure and then you have to convert it into free. Uh, but also you run into this little thing called the expression problem, which I will mention on a later slide. But tagless final does not have this expression problem. And that's the main reason why people use it is because it gives them the ability to express things that other different types of DSLs cannot. You can use arbitrary effects and there's a lot less uh, indirection and lower overhead at runtime, which as I mentioned, might be a concern for you. It probably isn't. Like I have no benchmarks to prove this or anything, but it, it, it should just make intuitive sense that if you are creating a data structure and you are parsing it and you are turning that into something, that traversal, that allocation, that's extra CPU cycles, that ex, that's extra memory. Tagless is much more direct. It takes your data to its functions and it applies directly to the interpreter. There are some other things uh, that uh, cause me to really like Tagless Final a lot. I, I hope I don't come across as too much of a shill, but I want to go through this list really quickly. It's pretty common. It's all across the ecosystem. You can extend it in multiple directions. Um, it's very lightweight. If you're doing OOP, the main thing you have to teach people is uh, what it means to be a higher kind of type, which I don't think is that complicated uh, to teach. Basically, what you're having to explain to people when they're getting introduced to tagless final is that your interpreter is not a function you pass it to, but pretend that you're teaching it like you're using an object of a certain uh, interface or class, but you don't know what it is yet. And that's all. 
it, it's basically the same kind of thing. And you can do everything that the other types of DSLs can do plus more because it's, uh, it's good with the expression problem. Uh, you can also combine multiple DSLs in a program just like we did with the previous example. We have this custom DSL and we also are reusing the applicative type class here so we can sequence our computations. So the expression problem, this is really funny because I ran into this while I was preparing for this talk. Uh, so if you're writing a DSL, depending on how you do it, you're going to lose some freedom of expression. And ideally what you want is when you're writing a DSL, you want to be able to extend that DSL without recompiling your code. You want to be able to use that DSL maybe as part of other DSLs. There are a lot of different things that you will run into where you're going, oh, well, I guess because we chose this way of writing the DSL, that's going to be kind of difficult. But in this case, that's not really true. You can avoid this by using tagless final style, but to illustrate the problem. So this is a very simple ADT uh, DSL here, but you can't add new operations to this DSL without changing it. You can't extend it. You can't say, uh, oh, I have this other DSL that is uh, the same set of operations as this one DSL plus the set in this other DSL. Using an ADT, however, like I mentioned, you can just implement whatever compiler you want. You can have as many as you want that do as many different things that compile. Uh, so here's one that compiles from an expression to unit. Here's one that compiles to IO of unit. And that's one of the main advantages of this style compared to to just using a bare trait that is not a higher kind of type. This is the same DSL, but let's say we're, we, we want to extend it. You can do this really easily with a trait. Uh, inheritance allows you to build on top of existing code and uh, create new traits and classes that allow you to share implementation details, share functions and type signatures, and the compiler will type check an instance of my larger DSL as an instance of my DSL as well. So this is pretty easy and this is pretty nice. However, you run into this one specific problem, which is that even though you can extend the DSL very easily and add new operations, it makes it very difficult to abstract over how they get implemented. So here's one example where you can implement the first DSL just by you know doing print line and reline. That's one implementation but uh, what if we want to do something else? What if instead of printing, we want to send something over the network? Well, you can still have that as a unit, but it would be nice if we could change the type a little bit where we could represent that with a custom effect. And that is where uh, tagless final comes in because that is basically what this is. Tagless final takes this notion of being able to have a DSL as a series of functions and then it allows you to abstract over the results so that your interpreters can be implemented however you want. And that leads us to this tagless version of the DSL that is combining the best bits of both of the previous styles. So we can have an extensible DSL like this. We can just say uh, we have our base DSL, my DSL, and then we extend it with my extended DSL down below. And all of the type parameters of the traits indicate that we are working with an abstract effect type. This means that all of the results from our DSL are also abstract and the user doesn't know what they are. Which means that they are working directly in terms of the, uh, the business concepts, the language that we are trying to communicate here. Of course, just like uh, all of the type classes you've ever used in your life, you can create as many instances of them as you want. And you can say, uh, we can have an instance for IO, we can have an instance for try, we can have an instance for this or that. And we can just say that, you know, given a type also has an instance of uh, FS2 files and an instance of a console from Cat's Effect, we can just say that that type will do just fine. So this gives us the extensibility both ways. We can add new operations and we can abstract over how those operations work at the same time with less runtime overhead. And I think that's kind of magical. Now we're going to dig into some code examples really quickly, just a couple. 
Okay, so we've hopped over here, and we are in this repository called ScalaCon DSL Examples. It is linked to at the end of the slides for this presentation, so if you navigate to the slides, which will be uh, referenced at the end of this presentation, I'll tell you the URL to get the slides. All of these examples are in Scala 3, but uh, sometime around the time this talk goes live, there should be Scala 2 examples as well. So I have a few different examples here that I'd like to show to you. The first one is very simple. I wanted to encode a DSL for a handheld calculator. You know, the kind like uh, the kind you'd get at the dollar store that's super cheap and can barely do anything. You have a running total and you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and maybe a couple other things. But for the sake of this demonstration, I've only implemented those four, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. There are two different ways I've implemented this. The first is as an ADT. I've, I've opted to go the sealed trait route because I wanted to have a couple different uh, layers of, uh, of ops here. So you have uh, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You compile your programs by making a list of these and passing them to this function. If you give it an add, then it will accumulate that value to the state. Subtract, multiply, and divide also change the state. If we want to try out this DSL, here I have this little example program in this test where I'm adding five, adding five again, and then dividing five so that we should expect the result to be two. So if, let's go ahead and try this and see what happens. Okay, that passes, and just to prove that I'm not faking this, I'll change this and run it again. Yeah, the difference is clear. We're supposed to get two. So run that again. Yeah, it works. The other way that I've implemented this DSL is as a uh, tagless final style. And this works exactly the same way, but it looks very different. We have all the same operations, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. The only difference is that instead of having a compiler that is a function that we pass all of our different pieces of data to, all of our operations are encapsulated in this abstract effect that we don't know what it is yet. So because we're accumulating state, I thought it would make sense to implement this as a stateful program. If you've ever used uh, CATS before, you might be familiar with the state data type State allows you to write state machine-ish programs that accumulate state. Now, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but this type is a little complicated looking. There's this asterisk here. A lot of users won't know what that means. That's what's called kind projector syntax, at least in Scala 2. In Scala 3, it was brought in as part of the language. Basically, this is a way to turn a type of two type parameters into one. But unless you know that, you know, this, this just looks intimidating and complicated. So why should a user have to type this in just to get a program to work, right? You can also write an opaque effect type. So I mentioned that you can use opaque types for things. You can also use opaque types for effects. So I can say that I have this type opaque calculator that is state of double. And that is the exact same type to the compiler. So over here I can write this uh, run extension method, which is the only way a user can interact with this besides uh, sequencing operations. And it will run it with a default of zero and then give you the state back. We can also reuse the state instance we defined above and the compiler is like, yeah, that's fine. You can go ahead and do that. And the reason that is, is because, well, it's the exact same type. We can also reuse the exact same monad instance for state. Uh, because I'm using this instance here, that means that in our example programs over here, we can sequence operations. So right here I'm using applicative, but I can change this to monad for the sake of example. And I can replace this with this, which is the exact same operator, but on monad instead. Save. And what do you know? We should be able to run this. And it works exactly the same as the other one. It's the exact same program. It's just expressed a slightly different way. And we're able to use an effect type that doesn't expose the underlying mechanisms of how exactly this works to our users. You can do lots of other things with opaque effect types. Like for example, you can write effects that um, 
encode something as a data structure. So you can go back and forth from tagless and a data structure. The next thing I wanted to show you is I have this library over here that I wrote that I thought would be kind of interesting. It is all about creating a CRUD based application. So CRUD is short for create, read, update, delete. And I've called this little mini project CRUD Lang. It's sort of a proof of concept of showing the kind of things that you can do with DSLs that mix and match with each other. So actually, I'm going to go over here first. This is the most important part, which is CRUD store, which is a general data store abstraction for a create, read, update, delete type scenario. As you can see, we're using some Scala 3 features like union types to say uh, what types of results you can expect. And this works for any type that has a known key, K, and value, V. So all of your items that go into this need to have a key so that they can be stored properly and indexed. And down here I have this implementation that's in memory that I'm not going to go into, but if you want to look at it, the code is all there. So I don't know if you've noticed that these are returning something called a uh, CRUD response. That's over here. There's a CRUD responses such as item created, item already exists, item read, item deleted, and so on. And then there's CRUD requests, which are how you actually interact with these programs. You give it a CRUD request, it translates that into an operation for the CRUD store, and then it gives you a CRUD response back. It's pretty boilerplate, it's, pr it's pretty simple, and if you've ever written a CRUD app, this is probably the same kind of thing you've had to re-implement over and over and over. Another thing that I want to show off here is uh, this little type class I wrote called keyed that I, I'm actually borrowing from a project that I'm working on on the side where I want to say that some value V has a key K and I need to be able to extract the key. So for every data type that has an instance of keyed here, you can extract some type of key for it. So for example, if, uh, you, if you had a user, their username might be their key, and this would be an instance of something you could define to extract that. And then you can write code that builds on top of that and says, hey, if you got a value and you can get a key from that, is there, uh, is there any way I can get that? Oh, there is, okay, so I can pass that key anywhere I need it, just like this here CRUD store, for example. So the, how this is all wired up is with a couple more things. There's this one quick thing, uh, status code mapping where for every response you need to map it to a status code if you're building a server. This is just an instance of something that you can supply for something. Over here in CRUD response, for example, if you scroll all the way down, there's instances for this. There's an instance for status code mapping. There's instances for encoders and decoders to JSON with Circe, a great JSON library. And the same thing for CRUD request, only there is not a status code one for that. But to actually wire everything together is this type request handler. If you've ever used Clisely before, you might be a little familiar with the idea of what this is going for. Clisely is a type in cats that is a wrapper for a function from A to F of B. So if you ever see Clisely like this, that's just, think of it like a function that looks like this. The only difference is it's a data type now and you can call certain functions on it. Request handler. I've defined as an opaque type, so you can't use it as a Clisely, just for the purposes of not making this overcomplicated. But um, I've created a way to create these pretty easily. So you can just define a function from a request to an F of response, and then that just gives you a request handler. And also, for any keyed data type that has a data store defined somewhere, you can automatically create a CRUD handler, which is a request handler for your CRUD app. It handles all the create, read, update, delete operations. It passes them to the data store right here, and then it gives you the appropriate response. And from there, once you have your CRUD handler, or any other handler for that matter, you can pass it to this two HTTP roots extension method, which of course, given a status code mapping, will turn it into an HTTP 4S HTTP roots. This is basically most of what you need to do to get a basic CRUD server working without any super advanced features. This is a little oversimplified, like as you can see, I'm only using a single path here and everything is submitted via post. You can, you can yell at me over Twitter for this. I'm very sorry about this, but I just, I just wanted to get something simple working and this does the job. 
I'm also happy to answer any questions about this code uh, later after the talk, but I'm trying to breeze through this a little bit. The actual app that works with this is pretty simple. It's a standard HTTP4S app. We're using uh, this server here. We're creating a store right up here. We are creating a CRUD handler for it. We are turning it into HTTP roots, then into an HTTP app using the HTTP4S DSL. And before that, we are also initially creating some records here. So what we're actually making is a, is a movie database. It's a create, read, update, delete database for movies. And I put a few movies in here already that I like, like uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the world and Ghost in the Shell and Birdman. And you can uh, get these values from the server. So actually, let's, let's run the server right now and see what happens. It should give us a little message. Okay, server is running. Down here, I have a little post script that just sends whatever uh, JSON file we have to the server. And I have this create JSON file here that will send a request to create the movie Dune, which just came out recently and is very good, by the way. You should all see it. Um, let's do that. And it gives us an item created response back. But maybe maybe we did something a little wrong and we need to update that to have the correct number of runtime seconds. Well, lucky for you, there's an update version here. So let's update. And of course the item was updated. And let's check to see if any of those initial ones were also updated, like Ghost in the Shell. And yes, Ghost in the Shell is in the database. It gives us all of the things that we said for it. So there's a lot of things going on here and I'm really rushing through this, but the gist of this that you should understand is that all of these things are written in such a way that we are not writing with the full Scala language. We are writing with an embedded subset of it that uses our uh, business logic and our domain specific um, concepts. So uh, I hope that these examples were interesting. Like I said, you can access them from the link in the slides that is going to be posted at the end of this talk. And uh, I guess it's time to get back to the presentation so we can wrap this up. So lastly, I want to touch a bit on uh, DSL design technique. The last thing that you want is a solution in search of a problem. Instead of building up from a lower level base, you want to build down from your top level requirements. So let's say we have, a, we have some requirements that read something like this. A financial account has a monetary balance. The balance is affected at end of day. The balance consists of US cents. At end of day, the balance is changed in response to particular events. The first thing you should do is you should try to understand the actual problem that is being solved. Instead of optimizing for some sort of a lower level thing and then building your way up, what you want to do is you want to take a top down approach using types. So yeah, you don't want to look at your system architecture. You don't want to be thinking about your database. You don't want to prematurely optimize. You do want to uh, create types for each concept that you are dealing with and have them modeled appropriately. Opaque types are really good for this if you're trying to do something using some type as a base. Um, you can also model the relationships of the requirements as a DSL. You want the compiler to work for you and you want it to tell you that your program will work even before you implement an interpreter or a compiler. So here's a really quick example. Um, we're saying we have cents and we have basis points. A basis point, if you've never heard of them, is uh, one hundredth of a percent. And it is used a lot in finance. We are defining a series of events based off of this previous requirements description. We want to be able to uh, say that if an event comes in, we should respond appropriately. And those events might not match up exactly to how our language works. So we're defining those as a separate enum. Beneath that, we have an account handler, which is just a way to say for a given account, you want to be able to mod the balance and mod the interest rate. So we can use these both with this end of day handler at the bottom. So given an event and a handler for an account, we can match on the event and say, uh, oh, if we're increasing the balance, then I'm going to modify it this way. Or if we're increasing the interest rate, then I am modifying it that way. And the result is always going to be of type f of unit. 
So now we're wrapping up, and I'd like to uh, give these uh, takeaways to you so that uh, t- we can summarize what we talked about here today. Uh, DSLs are any code that makes your business requirements easier to express, whether that's with custom syntax or maybe having some sort of a data structure or some kind of like trait or type class to express those things. External DSLs are really good for portability between languages, but uh, this is focusing on embedded DSLs. And embedded DSLs, if you're doing them, I would highly encourage you to do them in tagless final style because there are the least number of trade-offs. And then, of course, you want to write your code from the top down, starting with your requirements, first and foremost. And I just want to leave everyone with a couple um, resources. Uh, here are some, uh, here's, a, here's a blog post by Noel Welsh that I found really useful in um, understanding the nature of DSLs when I was starting out. Also, there's this great talk from Functional Programming with Effects, which I think, I think I've think i recommended this to, at, at the end of every single talk I've given, and I, I will continue to do so. It is a great resource if you're not entirely sure about why people abstract over effects or what the deal is with programming with effects and what that means. This is a great place. And just, uh, just not too long ago, there was this talk uh, on building a DSL with Scala 3 that I found pr- pretty interesting that I would recommend that you check out as well. And that is all. Uh, if you want to read the slides, you can go to slides.rpeters.dev and access them directly. I'm on GitHub as Sloshy and Twitter as uh, at Liquid Slosh a lot. Thank you all very much for joining. If you had any questions, uh, I will try to answer them now in the Q&A. Yeah!